What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Shooting the Shit Uncensored. I'm your host, Piers Austin, and I'm really, really, really excited to have my guest on tonight, the one and only TJ Perkins. But before we get into the interview, I just want to say a quick special thank you to our sponsors, our wonderful, wonderful sponsors who make this show possible every single week and first off is mayan belts if you want a championship belt you want a custom belt you want a replica of your favorite championship belt hit up my buddy eddie and ira williams on facebook and he will hook you up they've got special payment plans where you can pay as little as 20 dollars a paycheck until that belt is paid off and you can have yourself a championship belt Next is A Rock Designs. Now, A Rock Designs is a company run in Georgia by my good friend Ashley Rodriguez. She makes custom cups, hoodies, t shirts, keychains. She's all done a lot of stuff with wrestling theme, but also some cups and stuff with uh, non wrestling theme. Uh, I've got four cups on my way from them, and I can't wait. My last but not least, our sponsor is Signal Studios, a recording studio based in Sydney, Australia, by my best mate, Rafi Tomasi. And if you're a wrestler, you want some new entrance music, entrance music, I should say, uh, if you want some new entrance music, or if you just want a tune that you can write your own stuff to, Rafi can hook it up, send it out to you digitally, and you'll have it right there. Now, also, guys, just want to give a special mention to our Pro Wrestling Tees store, which you can find at uh, prowrestlingtees.com slash MWA World. The link is going to be somewhere down the bottom here. I am really unprofessional today. I apologize, guys. But some of the shirts that you'll be able to find is our MWA anime shirt, our MWA black and silver, our 2020 wrestling shirt, and our shooting the shit uncensored shirt. So, guys, without further ado, I'm going to bring on to you the man that you came to see, not sitting here, seeing me talking to you guys, doing selfless promotion or shameless plugs. Here he is, TJ Perkins. What's up, brother? How's it going, dude? Thanks for having me. Dude, I it's gone really well, man. I'm really excited to have you on. Thank you for, for giving up your, your free time to come and uh, shoot the shit with me, so to speak, man. Oh, not at all, man. I, I, uh, my, I got nothing but time these days for the most part. I mean, it's still a little busy, but it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Nah, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a pleasure to have you here, man. So how's everything been with you guys? Uh, you know, obviously with COVID and the lockdown and, and everything that's been going on. Um, I mean, I guess it's kind of a case by case question, you know, I mean, generally speaking, everybody's, you know, doing what everybody else in the world is doing, you know, trying to yeah. be safe and, and, uh, you know, being better about, which I, I don't understand how people weren't good about this before. Cause it kind of blows my mind how you can't like just wash your hands and be, <laughs> be like polite, you know? Um, but you know, people are, are getting better at that as they are, I'm sure everywhere else. And just trying to, uh, you know, follow whatever we got to do in the meantime, but you know, some parts, you know, America's huge. Well, Australia is huge too. So, Oh, like, nowhere near the size of America, though. But, well, I think the thing is, like, we're we're so big, and so so many different parts are like that. We hit different ends of the spectrum as far as being super densely populated, and, and other places aren't. So you know, it's awkward, like, because um, our our regulations and protocols change from like state to state, and um, you know, I think more like almost seventy percent of our cases were all just in like New York City alone. So like it, yeah. it gives such a weird imbalance for us. So you know, mo for the most part, everybody's just kind of trying to pass pass through it and uh, hopefully get back to normal soon. So, oh, absolutely. And uh, my good friend Kevin Rodriguez, uh, he says, TJP, thanks for taking the time to support the little guys like us. Uh, I just need you to do me a favor and beat the North. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're looking to do. Well, I mean, I guess if you've been following the news, we're going to have to beat more than just the North. So we'll see. Yeah, man. So getting into to wrestling, you were like 13 years old when you started training um, that I read. Yeah. You know, yeah. What was what was life like, like for you growing up? Um, I mean... It's funny. I was just talking to somebody the other day and uh, we joked about the uh, like, the, I guess you would call it like a colloquialism, but like it, it was a different time, but it really was such a different time. Um, and for me, like growing up, I mean, generally growing up, I uh, my, my parents work for the airlines. I have one younger sister. 
Um, so I grew up kind of quiet and, and alone. Like I didn't really have like a whole lot of friends. I was usually left to fend for myself, you know, for weeks at a time. And I, so I kind of got used to being by myself and also traveling at a young age too, just like having family that, that worked in that business. So, I mean, that was me growing up. My dad really wanted me to be an athlete. He was an athlete growing up. Um, so he kind of groomed me for that. But once I got to high school, um, you know, I just became a professional wrestler straight away. Um, yeah, I, I think I, at the time I had planned on trying to do amateur wrestling and then, you know, the internet and things weren't really around back then. This was 1998. So there really wasn't a way to get information or like lay like a, a ground plan, like a framework for what you wanted to do as far as pro wrestling goes. So like, I just assumed from interviews and stories I saw on TV, like, okay, so many of these guys are amateur wrestlers. So maybe that's what I got to do. And, you know, the, it'll sort of direct me in that way. I'm glad I didn't go that route because how stupid is that sound in retrospect, you know, but um, that's what I assumed. And so when my school didn't have an amateur program, um, I started looking for ways where I could just kind of jump right into it. And being in Los Angeles, there's a lot of Lucha Libre culture in the area. So I was able to get started right away. Those gyms kind of let you get in at any age. If you could walk and it's kind of like boxing with like Mexican wrestling, you know, like if, if you, if you can walk and you can put the gloves on, then they'll teach you how to fight. So same thing with yeah. wrestling. Like, yeah, if I can get in the ring, they'll teach me. And they did. And it was just me and the sport was just kind of a match made in heaven. I, everything I was told to do, I was able to do. And it just fell off me so naturally. And before I knew it, 22 years go by and here i am so <laughs> <laughs> was it was there ever a time like you know obviously when, when you're a teenager and, you, and and growing up you go through many stages in that period uh, you know that you love one thing one minute you hate not hate it the next but you sort of disconnect from it a little bit did you ever have that feeling with wrestling where you just were like nah uh, i'm kind of going to take a break from this for a while or was it always like mm. since 13 to now being like all guns blazing uh, I mean, really all guns blazing. I, I don't know. It's so weird to describe it. It's almost like sort of an introvertedness because I I just, I don't know how to like, it's tough to describe because I, I kind of felt like I always knew I would be a wrestler. So when it came up, I just, I was like, well, I knew this was going to be what it was. So I mean, it's like LeVar Ball. Like, I, I spoke it into existence, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, no, I mean, like, when I was, like, two, three years old, my earliest memories are watching Saturday Night's Main Event with my dad. And, like, I grew up thinking everybody loved wrestling as much as I did. And not having a lot of friends, I didn't understand that people were into other shit. Like, I just, like, <laughs> I just thought everybody must love this as much as I do. Yeah. And then, obviously, everybody must want to be a wrestler as much as I do. So I assumed everybody was going to be a wrestler growing up. I thought we all were. I, I don't, like, I know that there's doctors and firefighters yeah, yeah. and and other stuff in the world. But for whatever reason, I just, I was so singularly focused on it the thought about being interested in anything else just didn't even cross my mind. Yeah. And I think that that's the thing. It, it's, I, I was very similar when I was a kid growing up where I looked at pro wrestling as like every other, like I didn't understand indies and stuff like that when I was younger. And yeah. then as I got older, I'm like, Oh wait, there's like, what's this <laughs> easy W what's this ring of honor? What's it? You know what right, I mean? Like, right, and, yeah. and for me, I just thought like, you know, like, Oh, like I got a tape of ECW when I was like 14 and I'm like, Oh, this is like, this is looks different to WWE like that he's yeah. in WWE you know what I mean so I kind of always thought that every wrestling company was at the same level as WWE yeah. But, you, know, yeah. you, you got to train yeah. with uh with Christopher Daniels pretty early on a guy that you you know you guys pretty much shared a, a character with in, in your careers um you know did did Chris teach you the basics of wrestling because you're both from like that west um, uh west coast area correct yes so I'm assuming you brought up Chris from notes gathered off of my Wikipedia, probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's an error that for whatever reason, they like they don't trust me enough to tell them it's wrong. Uh, Chris was never really my trainer. We started around in the same area and I mean, he's got a few years. I mean, he's, I think he's like a 1995 guy. Um, but he was like one of the young and up and coming and, and sort of seasoned guys in the in LA when I was coming up. So I did learn a lot from him just from traveling with him 
in the car and stuff like that. Um, but he was never really like my coach or anything, but sure. we used to use him as a measuring stick as like, he was almost like the one, two, three kid to like older generations. Like it was like, if you can't wrestle Chris, you can't have, you can't have a good match. Like you're just, if you can't look good with him, you're no good. Cause he's, he was, he was so easy to work with and he's so good. And so like fundamentally sound that we, and he's so, uh, broad, like he, he can do a little high flying. He can wrestle on the mat a little bit. He can do a little bit of everything. He's so talented in that way. And he's got a great personality. So it's like, there's no such thing as something that you're good at that won't mix well with him. So that's kind of how we used to see it when me, Samoa Joe, you know, Rocky Romero, Ricky Reyes, um, like, uh, a Frankie Kazarian, a lot of us were coming up all at the same time. And we looked at Chris like that. It was like, he's, he's the guy that if you, if you can't do well with him, you, you can't, you can't wrestle. <laughs> Yeah, and um, also you you did some training with New Japan in the New Japan Dojo as well. Is that yes. correct? Yeah, okay. yeah, cool. yeah. How um, was that experience? It was. I mean, it was weird. I mean, it was kind of a. So much of the early years was like such a natural fit, and I didn't really know what to think of it because it, it almost made me feel spoiled because everything that I set my mind to started to come about exactly that way like when i was younger i mean i was a wwf guy growing up um i grew up on like the piper hogan jake the snake generation um and uh but i didn't grow up like kind of wanting a wrestlemania moment like a new japan was really like my holy grail like i just always wanted to be in new japan and i wanted to be in the super jacob specifically because the 94 95 jacob me and my friends we just we really oh. grew up on that so like um, so I thought that's a pipe dream, especially at that time when, again, like with no internet, no social media, really, like you didn't know, like there was no way to plan how to get there. And to this day, New Japan is still an insanely difficult place to get to. Uh, but at that time, it's like good luck because it's got to fall on your lap. And it just so happened it kind of did. They scouted me and I was in my senior year of high school. I had been wrestling professionally for three or four years, maybe at that time. Um, and I, yeah, my, my senior year of high school was like English class during the day and then sometimes ditch and get out and get into the dojo and get the shit beat out of me. Um, and who were some yeah. of the guys training you there? Um, let's see. So the class that they kind of brought in at that time, they recruited me, uh, American dragon, which most people know him as, as Daniel Bryan now, mm -hmm. um, the Havana Pitbulls, which is Rocky Romero and Ricky Reyes. And we were, we were the, the first class they, they scouted and Joe, they really wanted Joe, but he was a zero one guy. So at that time you couldn't cross lines like that. Um, so he would kind of be in and out of the gym, but he never went over, uh, to, to go on tour with new Japan. And, um, it was mostly an MMA gym at the time. Cause it was an Inoki installation. Uh, from Tokyo and so he really wanted to have like that old school focus from when like Fujinami and the original Tiger Mask was around so he wanted catch wrestling in the gym he wanted a lot of like you know boxing and Thai boxing things like that jujitsu submission wrestling he wanted us raised like that because like the 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 Tokyo side was becoming more and more Americanized and he wanted to maintain a certain balance so I think maybe he leaned a little too much on MMA and, and whereas like the the Tokyo gym now has gone full blown like new generation, which I think is great because now it it's so universally appealing. But, um, but you know, every day for us was mostly just fighting. We had a lot of fight coaches, a lot of fight teams would come down and work with us. Uh, the raw team, the shark tank guys, you know, we would have guys like Ken Shamrock, Tito Ortiz, um, guys like that, Don Fry coming in and out pride, pride fighting guys, Leo Tomachita before he went to UFC, he was training with us. Oh, so wow. I did a lot of sparting with Machita um and uh, and that was really a lot of our training we almost never did any pro wrestling in the beginning um so it was it was it was kind of a grind yeah were you like this is not what i fucking signed up for <laughs> <laughs> no i mean i i kind of thought of it as like um you know i had meant to go into freestyle and amateur wrestling and i didn't get that opportunity so you know getting now and when we got there the other guys were a little older so they yeah. treated them like okay these guys are guys we can make into stars right away so like our we all went on our first tours together and you know the rocky and ricky were immediately into the junior tag league 
American Dragon was immediately into like junior singles matches. But for me, like I they they wanted me to be a young boy. So they kind of did like the Benoit thing with me. So I was like, you know, shaved my head and they didn't make me wear black trunks because I was I had already been wrestling, but like I was a student. Like I had to go over to the Tokyo gym. They sent me, they transferred me basically, and I was in those gyms in the dorms and doing all the same thing that the Japanese guys did. And I was in the same class as Taguchi and um let's see Taguchi was in my class Yoshi Tatsu was in my class Nakamura Shinsuke Nakamura was in my class but he was kind of a superstar from amateur wrestling so he was already sort of being pushed uh through the system um and so for me it was intimidating because I also had to have that old school upbringing with like you know a million squats and push-ups all the time and getting smacked in the face when I make a mistake and things like that, sweeping floors and things. Yeah. So for me, it was, it was a kind of a double crash course. Cause I, you know, I was getting this great education in like technical wrestling and boxing and stuff like that stuff. I really wanted to, to be able to do. Uh, but I was also being groomed to be, you know, a protege. So. Yeah. And how much time did you spend with, with new Japan in that system? Um, well, let's see. I, I think for the most part, I spent all of 2002 in the LA gym at the, in the fall, uh, October, like shortly after my 18th birthday. So I turned 18 in September. So the next month they immediately processed a tour contract and a visa sent me to Tokyo on my first tour. And then what I would end up doing was anytime I would go on tour, I would go out like a couple weeks early and then I would transfer into the dojo there for like a week or a month or something like that. Go on tour, stay there till the next tour, you know, do that again, then come back to L.A. Then I'd be in L.A. and training there. And then I would just kind of go back and forth. So I was kind of like a double student. I was a young boy in both gyms for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, you, know, you had uh, a, a bit of early time. You went and spent some time with MTV's uh, WSX Wrestling yeah. Society. <laughs> um, how was that? Because like watching that as a as a wrestling fan, like it was like <laughs> that, like that you had some really good guys, but it was just like uh, I don't I don't know. Like to me, it's. It can be in, it was incoherent a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like it was just hit and miss, man. And what what was your experience there working like? Um, I mean, I only had a short bit. Uh, I was part of that first season, and I think I did the pilot as well. Um, and it was fun. And like you said, a lot of the guys there were great guys. And a lot of them, you know, they were friends of mine. So, like, it was kind of a who's who of who I love to share the locker room with anyway. So I liked it. But um, I think that it was – I mean, in a lot of ways, it was like the rough cut of Lucha Underground before they, you know, that concept fully came about because they had this very cinematic idea of how they wanted it to come off and a very gritty, like almost like a very overproduced ECW. Like if ECW yeah. is underproduced, <laughs> Lucha Underground is, this, or I'm sorry, um, uh, Wrestling Society X was like ECW if it was overproduced. And so um i think that it was like a tuning concept for for what ended up coming about because then later on i was also part of lucha libre usa which is on mtv and that was you know sort of a progression from that in a way and then lucha underground became this fully fleshed out idea through through el rey and and i feel like with a lot of the same people working on the projects too like it was kind of like inching towards that <laughs> eventually but i mean it was a lot of fun i just you know it didn't have a lot of time to really find itself yeah and i think like in australia like it was put on like we have it we have mtv here and mm. it was just put on at really random times <laughs> like <laughs> you know what i mean like i was like oh more wrestling great oh it's on at three o'clock in the morning like you know what i mean like yeah. it was just yeah. like it, it just didn't really seem like they got the the legs to it, but you know, it it was run by some you know like obviously Chris Kleinrock, former XPW guy. They had like mm -hmm. Chaos there, Vampiro. And they had Colt Cabana there for a while. Like they had some quality names there, but it was just like, as you said, it overproduced ECW. Yeah, yeah, and I, I just think that you know they they just simply didn't get enough time to kind of find their groove. You know, I mean, any anything, any kind of project like that you kind of live or die by that initial curve. And if you don't get enough time to get past that curve, you never really find your stride. And I think that's really what that was. Cause it's such an off the wall concept, you know? Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's, you mentioned, you know, Lucha Underground, you know, being, you know, obviously I thought, you know, again, they had a lot of great talent. They had a lot of great storylines. 
you know but yeah yeah no i thought it was i thought it was uh it was a lot of fun it was really interesting a lot of great guys you know matt sidell was in there too um, yeah and and you know teddy hart i mean there's so many guys that that ended up being such a huge part of that decade of wrestling but you know it just didn't have enough time yeah um yeah no i completely understand um with that but you know being in wrestling at, at such a, early, a young age did you ever find you know that w when getting in the ring that other guys would take liberties with you you know give you stiff shots like ah come here kid and and really sort of take advantage of the situation thinking oh he's not gonna know what to do in this thing so i'm gonna give him a stiff one this is the business kid or was it more that people tried to guide you and nurture you and, and build you up a bit more Oh, hell no. The guys that were trying to guide and nurture me would beat me up worse than the other <laughs> than, <laughs> than the strangers. Um, no, I mean, it was, it really was like the wild west back then. Um, you got to remember this was at a time where I like, man, the, the advent of social media and the way that information travels now, it's created so much regulation for everything. And at the time with that big piece of the world missing at that time, I mean, it really was the wild west. I mean, just even the process of going to shows, like I had to literally look on map, a physical paper map and like, okay, I got, I have to drive 50 miles or however many kilometers I get. Like, yeah. So it's like, that's what it was like just to go to shows. And so, yeah, I mean, like guys would beat up on you guys would gatekeep a lot more because there's nothing keeping them in check, you know? Yeah. And so you really had to survive in a lot of ways and people didn't people didn't give a shit that i was 13 14 15 years old in these matches so, i mean i've been there trying to survive with guys that are 25 30 years old you know i'm riding in cars with guys that are their biggest problems are taxes mistresses cocaine and alcoholism and i'm like dude i didn't finish my homework last night like that's that's my problem <laughs> like <laughs> so you know yeah there, there was this big kind of uh generation gap and and physically guys were really hard on me a lot you know yeah and that would have been that would have been hard especially for for a teenager and especially around the 13 14 year old mark where it's like <laughs> you know listen like that i can just imagine what I, my thought would have been at that age we're like fuck this <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah as and look yeah as much as, as as we love wrestling there's only so much that you know people can sort of take but it, i think that speaks wonders for the determination and the person that you are to just you know keep pushing through you know to get to where you wanted to get to and that's the thing it's you know i admire people that start at such a young age and then continue through it because the pro wrestling world is is a very savage beast you know it's it's not all what we see on television um you know and and that's why i got a lot of respect for you and others that do it you know so my hat's off to you sir but <laughs> but in saying that man um the the speaking out movement that that's you know had the whole that pretty much turned the wrestling world on its head you yeah. came out with a tweet um re responding to um session moth uh her tweet yeah. Yeah. and you were you, you sort of announced um you know what you were saying and i've got it here if you don't mind i'm just going to read it and then just obviously we'll, we'll touch on this um your tweet was i've always felt that double standard is wrong on the flip side i shared two stories last night with loved one of myself at 15 being taken advantage of pressured by older girls in wrestling who were 20 to 22 at the time um hard hard to share because men are expected to be proud of such things what makes it tough in other direction is guys are both expected to be proud of such things and also shamed of the sexist nature of being proud of such things but it felt uncomfortable, nervous, empty, etc. As anyone would feel in that situation, difficult to express. I definitely don't suggest it 50-50 or anything. And I absolutely don't take any focus away from anyone who is sharing regardless of gender. There's obviously double standards existing both ways and everyone's experience are different and should be viewed individually. Those are pretty, pretty deep words, man. And you know, hearing that and, and reading about that part of your story. And, and, and like I said, we don't have to go into the finer details um, of it, but, you know, being 15 and put in that situation, you know, you know, like obviously w there was a lot of confusion for you, but how did you overcome that? And, and, you know, was that ever something that really made you like question where you wrestled at times or who you were around? Well, 
I mean, the best way for me to, I mean, you got to understand too, everybody's perspective on life is going to be different. My personally, the way I see the world is, is very, I don't know, I guess Darwinistic, you know? Yeah. Um, I expect the world is, is never going to be fair. And it's, I expect it's not going to be fair to me. And I, ex it's kind of like, if you go to like a picnic or like a, a group or a community thing, and let's say you start like, like a potato sack race or something like that, you know, or like, like the two legged race where a guy, you know, you and a partner are like tied together and, you know, it's yeah. just a fun thing. And everybody's been in this sort of situation where something like an activity like that or whatever gets started. And then right from the go, somebody's cheating or there's something wrong and you're trying to point it out. And the judge is like, I don't care. Everybody's going. So you're going to lose. Like, that's how I see life. So I don't want to ever be that person that's like sitting back and saying, whoa, 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 wait, something's working against me. Like, dude, life is going to leave you behind. So you have to be able I mean, you don't want to have those inequalities, but you also have to to me, I feel like it's it's more about expecting you're going to have to survive at some point. It's kind of how I got through a lot of the tough stuff. I mean, what we just touched on before this was, you know, people being hard on me. Like, I, I kind of had to go into it expecting that. Like, I'm going to be put through the ringer. Like, you, you have to survive, dude. That's what I would, or rather, that's my conversation with myself. So, you know, I didn't necessarily question that, you know, maybe I shouldn't be in certain places because... I mean, as we've start, as we've now come to know this year, like, I mean, is any place really safe? You know, like that's the real, the real answer to that is possibly not, you know? Um, so that never really crossed my mind, but it, it, I never really spent a lot of my younger years thinking I was like a victim or anything. Like it, it didn't cross my mind in that way. And it's such a, and that's why I, I felt the need to kind of share that. Cause for a lot of people, that's a very confusing situation to be in. And even to this day, I feel fortunate that I didn't come out of it with like a lot of trauma. As far as I know, maybe I did like subconsciously, you never know. Um, looking back, that was my first experiences with, with girls ever. So that probably affected like my social upbringing because, you know, again, I skipped proms and dances and girlfriends and stuff like that growing up because I was wrestling for like a workaholic. So my first experiences are being way out of my depth with these people. And so you know, that, that could affect you. But, um, you know, I chose to share it without certain details, obviously, because the, you know, people don't need to know all the details. And I chose specifically not to label the individual people because it, it was really more for other people. Like I didn't feel the need to vent myself and I didn't want to interrupt like this, the speaking out movement. Cause I don't think that, you know, focus needs to be on me or something like that i wanted for other people who may have been in that type of situation and maybe they feel like they're a greater victim than i to feel more comfortable that like hey there are other people who can safely express themselves maybe i can too and i got a lot of positive response from you know guys and girls that are like hey i've been i've felt in that situation where it was you know i felt pressured it felt natural but it got out of hand and looking back it was a bad situation for me and I'm glad you shared it. So now I feel like I can express it because I saw how you were able to do it. Now I know how to word it, you know, or whatever the case may be. So it was really for that. And, you know, those two women, for example, um, one is completely out of the wrestling community at this point. The other, I think, is still involved in wrestling, but they both have families of their own and kids of their own. And so um, and I've been able to maintain a healthy relationship with anybody in my life and mm -hmm. a positive connection to even them going forward. So I didn't feel the need to, I, I feel like the punisher wouldn't fit the crime if I were to say, oh, this person did that, or this person did that. Sure. So like, so like, fuck you. Like, that's not the energy for, for me in this case. So I chose to share it in the way I did because, you know, their kids don't deserve to have to deal with social media <laughs> backlash for that you know yeah. i came out of it okay so and for others that didn't come out of theirs okay i shared because i want them to feel safe to share too because they need the help more than i do mm. um and and that's really what my goal was and uh and and for the beginning of it when i said double standard that actually this was the reason i chose to spoke up was because um when sesh had said that she hates the idea of like the word ring rat, for example, mm -hmm. and slut shaming for women. 
that is actually exactly why I wanted to chime in was because I've always thought that that's ridiculous that the women in our industry have to deal with that or just women in general. Like, yeah. um, and I think she and I have the same view, like, I mean, we're friends, so I guess, you know, we do have like-minded view of stuff, but, <laughs> but like, we have the same view of, as far as like, there's nothing wrong with promiscuity. You know, if, if that's what you choose to do, and that's how you live your life. You're not hurting anybody or breaking a law. Then great, do you? That's fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And you know, there's an element to that where you might be cheating on your significant other or something like that. And you know, that's not great, but that's your life to sort out. You know, mm -hmm. and if you're not hurting somebody or breaking a law, then that's that's your private thing to deal with. That's that's your trouble. Um, you know, but the idea that as a community, we shame one gender for it and the other gender we don't, that's mm -hmm. the double standard that I disagree with. Because if you're gonna call a girl a ring rat for you know, living her life, so too should the guy, you know? Yeah, no, I've I always, like I've always felt that. So, you know, I agreed with her, you know, retire that stupid term and and stop shaming people like that you know i mean stop shaming people generally for anything for god's sakes we need more positivity in the world <laughs> but you know if you're going to to speak up on something that you feel might be negative or if you want to get on your soapbox about something don't don't divide it by gender or any kind of line like you know split it both ways like that that's what i really wanted to chime in on initially and i shared my story because there's a lot of examples of of you know double standards i guess you can say you know there's a lot that women deal with and then for the men like a lot of men can't share stories like i shared because like you had read you know in the follow-up messages we're expected to be proud of that behavior we're supposed to be domineering and like conquerors mm -hmm. so to speak and it's like we don't all feel that way i know that i've never looked at myself like this alpha male guy that's proud of you know any sort of thing like that it's just you know so it, it's hard because when when there are people in my situation that may have had a harder time dealing with it and it's hard for them to share because you know the community makes us feel like we can't yeah and i think that's exactly it's exactly right you know and it, it, it you know i think we're about the same age maybe i'm a few years older than you but I think a few years older, but, um, you know, it, you know, I grew up in a time where, you know, like myself and, and I've been very open on this show that I have suffered from depression f since a teenager and where I grew up in the environment that I grew up in the area it was around the friends and stuff was a tough neighborhood. So I couldn't really say, Hey, I'm struggling because it's like, Oh, you're a wacko. You know what I mean? So it's the same thing with, with slut shaming and, and, and calling women ring rats, you know, my, my family were hippies. So like, for me, it's always like, it's all been love and positivity. It's like yeah, that sort of yeah. like people being, man, you do you baby. You know what I mean? As long as you're not hurting anyone and, and you know what I mean? As long as you're not hurting anyone and doing anything no, too I, crazy and stupid, you just do what absolutely. you need to do. You know? so, and and but, yeah, I mean, when, when like, you know, our generation, you know, if us being the same age, like, I mean, when, when, for example, when those incidents that I shared, when they happened, I remember the first one, when it first happened, the first thing I did that night, I mean, literally, as soon as I got back in the, my front door, I called a, like one of the older wrestlers that is sort of like a big brother to me. And I was like, bro, this, this just happened. I didn't know what to think of it, you know? So you, you it's hard to process, oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I hadn't had a girlfriend or even like my first kiss at the time. So like to deal with that, like, I mean, I'm like, I, this, <laughs> what, like this just happened. And his take was, oh, good for you, bro. Awesome. Like, it was like, like, oh, great. High fives. And it's like, so to, to me, it's like, well, okay, I guess I'm supposed to be happy about this. You know, like yeah. you don't know. And, the, it, and then you become programmed that way. And like, it's just one of the, it's one of those things where that's, that's how they're, you know, certain levels get built in just by, by community, you know, narratives and, and perception. Yeah. And I think, I think teenagers and around that age at 15, like 
you know, 15 year old boys will talk a big game, but I think that when you're in that situation, <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, you know what I mean? It's, it's a different, like, you know what I mean? Like, we, we've all been there. We've all been teenagers before where we all like right. beat our chest and all that sort of a shit. But in reality, when you're in the situation, it's it's not exactly how you relive it when you tell your boys afterwards. No, you know? it's true. And and in all honesty, and I, I mean this very candidly, like both of those scenarios, I feel like the only reason they came to a stop at the moment that they did uh, and didn't go any further was simply because I had no idea what I was doing. Because yeah. it's true. Like you're, you, when you're that age and I didn't even talk a big game, but yeah, when you're that age, you may talk a big game, but certainly like you're not, that's out of your depth. You're not ready for that. And I almost thank God that I, I wasn't, I hadn't been that active even with other people my age because not having any clue what I was doing and being a deer in headlights honestly may have saved me like actual trauma or, or for it to have escalated it even further. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, look, we'll, we'll move on from that. We do, we do have a, a couple of comments coming in. So I mentioned Kevin Rodriguez, a friend of mine. He actually runs a show similar to this. He's based in Georgia in the United States yeah. called The War Room every Thursday night at 7.30 p.m. Um, Kevin says, "Where were you, were you picked to win the Cruiserweight tournament from the beginning or was it a match-by-match -match basis? Um, I think that they had went into it assuming it would be a match by match basis because I don't think that they had me picked from round one, but after round one or two, they had asked me who I wanted to wrestle in the finals. And so I knew I was at least going that through the, that to that point. Um, and I think them asking me, I kind of knew, well, I must be going all the way through or else they would have asked the other guy if who they wanted, you know what I mean? Instead of asking me. So I kind of knew early on. So they did kind of have me picked at a certain point pretty early, but I don't think necessarily from the very beginning, but I, I mean, they did kind of protect me and baby me all the way through the process, even before the tournament started. So maybe they did have me picked because I, I remember like, and this is sort of a layered answer to this, just to put it into context. So you go to a place like a WWE when you're a young wrestler and you're used to just being treated like shit. You're, you're lower than dirt. You know, there's, you can't do anything right. And I remember having been around WWE so many times, even before that, I mean, I was doing WWE matches when I was like 21, something like that. And, yeah. and, that, and that's how it is. They treat you like that. So I went into this thinking, I'm not going to stay here. This is a great opportunity, but you know, I'm going to move on after this and whatever. And, and, and I know what it's like before that. So I'm not going to go in jumping through hoops for these guys because they're going to put it on me anyway. And they didn't. And I remember showing up late for some stuff or just like not following dress codes and thinking I'm going to get reamed or I'm going to get fined or something. And they would, I would come in late to a meeting. They would usher me into a back room and be like, here, here's what we covered. We'll just catch you up on it real quick. And I'm like, why are you guys babying me so much? You know, you used to yell at me for this type of shit. And mm -hmm. so um, I remember being in the PC in this, you know, before the tournament started and doing workouts and like trying, trying out some things that I do that, that belongs to, to other main roster dudes and guys weren't checking me on it. Or if it was something really important, they'd pull me aside and be like, hey, you know, and kind of give me a tip. And they would tell me like later on, like referees or people I'd be working with, they're like, I knew what they were going to do with you. So I didn't want to see you end up getting into trouble or anything. So maybe they did pick me early on, but I know as of round two, they, they had asked me who I wanted in the finals. I actually said Zach, uh, Zach or Metallic. And they went with Metallic because I think they liked a more layered sort. Me and Zach might've been boring to a lot of people because <laughs> I mean, not everybody likes hammer locks and octopus holds. So um, <laughs> But they uh, they ended up choosing Metallic off my shortlist. Yeah, and you know when I saw you get announced for the, for the Cruiserweight Classic, like I've been a big fan of yours um, for a long time prior to to the Cruiserweight Classic, and I, you were my pick. Like I remember sitting down with my buddies, <laughs> and I was like, "Man, TJP, baby, he's gonna he's that, that's my pick." And that was it. And when you won, I was literally like, "Man, you should have you should have put some money down. You were probably one of five people that had me picked." <laughs> Dude, my my son was a new new. Uh, he was only like young, like a newborn at the time, and he was yeah. asleep in like the the little thing on the floor and i remember jumping up going, fuck yeah man like and my wife's like shut the fuck up <laughs> i'm like it's all right little dude yeah my daddy's pick one but um you know in the in the wwe that when you were there 
you know, and to to be in that situation of being the first holder of a championship belt, you know, and as you said, there was guys there that you felt that they were babying you to sort of help you along because they had a good feeling about you. You know, that feeling of, of winning that championship and being the first person to hold that above above your head, what was that feeling like for you? Was it just like another match or was it like this is this is a major moment in my career? Um I mean it is it is just another match. One of in, in I mean it's both, but you know, for starters, it, it is just another match. One of the best pieces of advice I've ever got was I got it from two different people. I got it from Roddy Piper, I also got it from Scott Norton. Uh, both of them, the reason I got it is because both of them at different times, different shows altogether, I had asked them for advice. I said, did you see any of my work? Is there anything you could tell me? And both of them gave me the same answer. First, they looked at me like I'm an idiot. idiot. <laughs> and then they both basically told me, look, you know, if you make, you're doing what you're doing, you are where you are. If you made a mistake out there, I don't need to tell you, you know damn well what you did wrong because you're in there, you can feel it, you know what, you know what the problem was. And you can't change it because that match is done. You're going to have a thousand more. So move on. And that's the way I've, I, I've taken everything. So people ask me, what's your dream match? The next one. I, I don't, I don't have, I don't have idols in this, you know, and, and I, I, I could be at a pay-per-view one night and it's like, was this a dream come true? I don't know. I got to I got to be at raw tomorrow like that there's always the next one and that's the way i looked at this one too in a way but in a lot of ways it was validating you know because you you spend so long and i was i don't know year 18 maybe at the time so um you spend so long doing all these things and i had been in new japan cmll triple a um tna ring of honor before this and never really took on the role of like the star like i was never that guy you know, I was always the guy helping the stars. And so to kind of be, for the first time, be the guy that's put on a run and to have made it work, that's validating. Cause it's like, you think the whole time I could do this if I was put in that position, but I'm, I'm here to help others. I'm going to do that. So the one time it finally comes up that that's what you're chosen to do and you do it and you knock it out of the park, then it's like, okay, yeah, that was, it was very proud moment and validating. And it was validating because, you know, it was the first time I got to actually be myself and portray myself and my community. You know, at so many times I had been, you know, I've had jobs held over my head if I didn't speak Spanish and be able to portray a Mexican wrestler. And it's like, dude, that's not even my, it's not even, <laughs> even my ethnicity, you know? And I mean, yeah, sort out that many levels of racism. I don't know. <laughs> like, oh, dude. And, and so, like, to finally be like, you know, can I put my people's flag up there? And Hunter says yes. And can I be from LA? And this is my name. And I'm, you know, I'm, you know, this punk rock technical wrestler guy. Yes, be all of that. That's what you are. And it, that was, it was like great. Thank God for once I could just be myself. Um, so it's validating for that reason. And, you know, I had a lot of things working against me. I mean, I was beating a lot of people's favorites. People did not like that. So every, every round, the booze got louder and louder and louder. And it's like, as a guy who grew up a Kobe Bryant guy, like my hero is like the king of dealing with that. So I, for me, it was like, all right, I'm built for this. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it work. So, you know, I get the best matches I can out of the guys I'm working with and continue to help them be heroes and then be able to succeed in the end at turning the people the right way. And in a, in a, in a funny way, the people that really disliked me, they worked against themselves because every single round, another way that I was kind of babied, I would get back through the curtain and Hunter, Regal, um, Shawn Michaels, Terry Taylor, they'd all be waiting for me behind the curtain to, you know, ask me what I thought, see if I'm comfortable with everything, you know, if I had any questions or if I needed advice, they were there to answer it. And Regal had pulled me aside and said a, a very primary thing of why I was kind of their guy at that time was because they said, you're able to walk out there with like literally through the fire and do what you're supposed to do in the time you're meant to do it with or without a language barrier get the other guy in the position he needs to be to succeed and also turn everybody to the right reaction that we want at the end. And so, 
you know, for people that have been so hard on me, they, they ended up sealing my fate to succeed <laughs> because if they would have cheered me, maybe they wouldn't, maybe the office wouldn't have cared, <laughs> but they saw, they saw what I was able to do. And I think that sp- to them that spoke to like my professionalism, I guess, is the way they described it. So I was, I was proud for all those reasons. Yeah. And you know, your, you, your reign with, with the title, I think could have been a little bit longer in my opinion. Um, I, I think they kind of, they, they flipped it a little bit in the early stages with, of the introduction well, of that did, title. I did ask them to, to be oh, fair. Okay. I, uh, before it wasn't the, after the first pay-per-view I beat Kendrick, we're going into that second pay-per-view and I, I had met with Hunter and I don't know if this was the reason, but I did ask them, I said, um can we flip this title because i felt like brian needed it and i felt like it was a good story to tell if they really wanted me i could always come back to it you know that's fine but like w- the thing was from a sy- from a systematic point of view we were doing things backwards and i don't think anybody involved realized it and to this day i don't think anybody does normally if you get a guy and let's say it's like elias whoever gender you know, they get called up out of a developmental or something like that. They're by themselves. They get the spotlight to themselves and they're going to work opposite somebody like a Jericho or a Roman Reigns or an Undertaker or something like that. Shawn Michaels, whoever. And they're going to interrupt them, have some kind of confrontation. They're going to look strong against them. And most likely they're going to beat them mm. at the gate, you know. And if they don't beat them, they're at least going to get the better of them in some way, even if they lose. And from that point on, they, you know, they get to take that momentum with them. So we were doing it opposite. We weren't allowed to mix in with the the popular guys. And there was 10 of us coming in together, not one guy. So I thought the worst thing we can do is build it around one guy. I don't want to be the one guy because everybody else is going to suffer because now everybody's first introduction is going to be the guy that lost to me. And I don't want that. And that's kind of what happens when it got built around, like when it got built around Neville, for example. And I love Punk. Mm. I loved having a division. I'm so glad we had him and I would wrestle him a thousand times in a row. But creatively speaking, the Goldberg run kills everybody because now we're all La Parca, you know? Yeah. Like, so then uh, I I thought we should flip it to Kendrick. Then we should flip it to Cedric. We should flip it to Tozawa. We should flip it to, you know, whoever. That's what we should be doing is make it look like anybody could win at any time. Kind of like the UFC, you know? Um, and that way, when, when eventually when we get more grounded and more popular, then you could build it around one guy like WWE in 1993. It's a one hour show, small roster. It's the same thing as like 205. Um, mm. you can, you can build it around Brett because it's okay. If Sean loses, it's okay. If Lex Luger loses, people know who they are already. They're, they don't lose established. Losing. Yeah. yeah. We weren't established. So I remember asking Hunter specifically once we uh, we're at full sale after an NXT taping. And I said, you know, maybe it's a good idea if we go with Brian. Um, and we did. We went with Brian. And then it went to Rich. I think for a while it was really interesting because it was like, you know, I could beat Brian, but Brian could beat me. But Rich could beat Brian, but I could beat Swan. And Cedric is coming up and Jack is coming up and all these guys are coming. So then it's like you you had this interest where, okay, who's going to wrestle who now? Um, that's what I thought we needed. I wish we would have done that for a little bit longer period of time. Yeah, no, I – um. I definitely understand that, and I, I can see it from your perspective now. Like, yeah, you know I mean, I think as as a fan, I was seeing it more of a one sided kind of thing. So, but you know, w- with your departure from WWE, they decided to obviously, you know, not renew your contract. Um, what was the story behind that? Was it just something that they you guys couldn't agree to terms, or was it you know were you not happy with that in the situation you're in? Um, I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy anymore. I was coming into the last year. So I would have had to renew in May, I think. Mm. It was released in February, if I remember correctly. And um, I uh, a year before that, I had met with Vince in London. We are at the O2 or something. I knocked on his door and I, I just told him, I, I said, I felt like... Um, I don't feel like I'm a commodity to you. I don't think I'm valuable to you as I am right now. Um, right now, I'm just a guy in tights and a good wrestler on the show. But you have a company full of great wrestlers. Everybody in this company is a great wrestler. Um, and so that doesn't separate me. That and I'm not a commodity to you in that way. And uh, and I'm not. And I'm. And most of all, I'm not happy. 
And so he said, well, what can we do to use you better? And I said, I'll show you. So I spent a year um, trying to readjust myself and what I felt like my value was to him. And in my opinion, it's my community. When I was coming through the CWC, I was this Filipino American, Asian American star. And um, nobody had represented Filipinos before. Nobody had represented Asian Americans before necessarily. And that's a huge demographic, huge, huge demographic. Yeah. And Filipinos specifically are very passionate fan base. And uh, all we have is Pacquiao, you know, they, they never really put Batista in that position. And a lot of us who are Filipino or, or Asian American, we, we hoped that guys like him would be pushed in that direction and they weren't. So it worked so well going to CWC, but when I got to Raw, they separated me from that. And that's what I wanted to get back to. So I spent a year uh, making my own appearances, doing, you know, community events, doing red carpets and banquets and things for, and doing Filipino media and stuff like that, doing interviews, collaborating, like I would go on stage and present stuff with, you know, Apple, the app from Black Eyed Peas. I, I trained with Manny Pacquiao and did all this different stuff and worked with some influencer groups that like to do like, um, uh, community events for like the NBA or the NFL. So like when you go to like a Golden State Warriors game and they have Filipino Heritage Day and it's like they have a special Warriors jersey with the Filipino sun and food vendors and charities outside and then they promote it around a Filipino or an Asian player. These mm -hmm. groups were like, okay, we'll work with you and we would love to do that for WWE. So I put all this together in a big package and brought it back to Vince. I said, and Survivor Series. So was, I met with them in February. I spent the year and then at Survivor Series week, somewhere around then, knocked on his door again and said, this is how you can use me better. And I showed him all that. And he said, great. Uh, we need to get you on a different show then. So I think it was raw that we were aiming to. And he said, and Vince is way as creative as the horse that pulls the, the carriage. So he said, we got to think of creative for you. And then we do all this stuff with it. And I said, great. So I started writing pitches and making pitches. And uh, I wrote for everybody. I mean, I wrote stories or me and, Bobby Lashley, me and Finn, me and Roman, me and Miz, me and Jinder, me and Elias, me and Gargano, me and anybody on any show, any roster, I wrote stories for. Um, and none of them were a good fit. All these guys were doing other stories that they wanted to go with instead. And in some cases, I started to get a little sour because they would take my story and then use it for somebody else. Um, the Leo Rush thing with uh, Finn and Bobby Lashley, like that, that was something I wrote, and then they put Ricochet in that spot instead, mm. um, which is fine. I like I, I don't have any problem with the guys. They all need pushes, so I, sure. I'm glad that they got that. So that I have no qualms with that. But it started to get frustrating because pitches weren't being turned in, or they're just being stolen, or they just weren't a good fit. So eventually, um, yeah, they just. Uh, uh, the office was like, Hey, you know, Vince has a lot of respect for what you're trying to do, but he doesn't want you to be unhappy. And I had already expressed that if we can't make it work, I, I want to go back to Mexico, go back to Japan and do some other stuff. Cause I'm not happy here, you know, and I don't want to waste his time and money. So they said, you know, he's, he doesn't know what to do with you right now. So if you want to spread your wings, go and do your thing. And then that's it. Um, and that's, you know, that was it. So <laughs> yeah. And how how was how was it left with it? Was it good terms? Was it saying you know let's try and talk it? Yeah, somewhere down yeah. the road or yeah yeah. Um, there's been once or twice that we've touched base. Um, and you know continue to you know let's check back in in the future sort of thing. And then um, there's also some stuff that I know that there was like some kind of like extra type of content that they might want to have me for them not in ring but like digital content of some sort and um in that case that you know they don't interview you or put you on a dvd or anything like any uh, a countdown show they wouldn't do that without clearing you first so you know they cleared me to do extra content for them um so i know <laughs> i definitely know that i'm i'm not like on some sort of blacklist for <laughs> <laughs> secretly but you know they never expressed any frustration like you know professionally behaviorally or anything like that it was just creatively they knew i wanted to leave and and i wanted to make it work i don't believe in quitting you know i don't i'm not one of those people that are like i'm gonna take my ball and go home you know yeah. i i just i i wanted to make it work and they didn't want what i wanted to do and so now i'm just doing it outside and you know 
So for now, that's that's how it goes, I guess. We we have a Facebook user throwing up a comment saying TJP is the hacker. I'm calling it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, considering that TJ's under contract with Impact Wrestling, I think that might be a conflict of interest for him. So well, I could be I I could be wrong, man. I I, I don't know. Like <laughs> you actually are. I'm not under contract. Oh, okay. Not, a, not under contract, but we uh, we have a very good agreement for now, and and you know hopefully maybe in the future that'll be more exclusive. Uh, I really love it there, um, but yes, I I am I am playing for that team at the moment for sure. <laughs> but that's the thing, Impact Wrestling, where you're at now, and you know you you've definitely spent a bit of time there. Um, yeah. and I understand we're getting to that hour mark. Um, so I am being conscious of your time, TJ. Oh, but I did want to ask, right, yeah. um, you know. When you came in as suicide, you know, uh, you know, you came in under a, a character that had already been established, and they really kind of broke that fourth wall down with having you without the mask on. Um, yeah. Was that something of your idea to sort of put your own flavor to that character to have that thing? Is like once I put this mask on, I become this person. But when the mask is off, I'm TJ. Um. Yes, but not necessarily by design. I was just trying to clean up shit that they were losing track of. <laughs> they kind of were fumbling the football and didn't know what they wanted to do with it. So, like yeah. for example, it's actually ironic because I mean I'd spent so I was in TNA year one as Puma, and then for all these years I was in and out and doing X cups and stuff. And then I remember when they had a meeting. We were at a pay per view in Houston, two thousand eight, maybe. And that was when they told Kazarian, "Hey, we we're, we have this new character we want we want you to do." And it's Susan. And he was just starting to kind of find himself as a performer, and like, and he really needed to be himself. And then they're telling him, "We're going to put you in this suit." And I remember he was so disappointed. He got back in the locker room and he was like, oh, "I don't want to do this." Blah 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 blah. And we joked, we joked, and and I think it was Daniels, Christopher Daniels, was like, "They should just have TJ do it. He's already in a mask." And I was like, yeah, haha, whatever. And I ended up going back to Japan and doing indies or whatever the case was, went to Ring of Honor. And Kazarian became suicide. And it, the character didn't quite go the way that they wanted it to be for a while. Mm. So when I came back, they, they signed me again as Puma in 2012 or 13. And I sat at home. And I, uh, there, Al Snow was like, we'll think of something for you in the meantime, but just relax for now. We'll think of something. And I saw these bumpers, suicide's coming in, you know, soon, suicide's coming soon, suicide is coming next week. And I remember calling them. I said, I don't know if you know what you want to do with this character, because I know you guys have just put whoever in it before. Yeah. But if you don't have anything to do for me to do, I'll do this. And he said, that's a great idea. Let me run it by the office. And I said, okay. So it was just supposed to be one match. They had no plan. They just wanted to bring it back for nostalgia. But then they saw the way that I did it. And I think that, you know, previous suicides were always heavyweight type styles. And so yeah. the, for the first time, they had this like Deadpool Spider-Man type of guy in it. And they're like, this is what we thought it would be the whole time. And so Dixie, all these people, they were like, we got to keep doing it. So one match turned to two, two matches turned into the pay-per-view. Then all of a sudden it was like, we're going to put the <laughs> exhibition title on you. And I said, okay. And then they didn't know what they were doing with it as far as an end and they unmasked it to help with the Austin Aries story. Mm. But then they were like, we don't want to stop having you a suicide, but we don't know what to do now. And so, yeah, I, 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 so I kind of came up with, well, why don't we just make it a Tony Stark thing? Like Tony Stark wore a mask. He was a superhero. People mm -hmm. knew who he was. It was never about hiding his identity. That's just his uniform. It comes with a mask. He's not trying to hide it, you know, um, let's be that. And so that's what they did. And I, you know, I interjected some like sarcastic humor in it because I'm a big Deadpool, Deadpool fan. And like, you know, I still, you know, wrestled the way that they wanted it to be. So it was really just me kind of troubleshooting. Every time they would hit a dead end, I would say, okay, I could fix this for you. <laughs> and, so I, and so I did. And, you know, that's what we did for like four years. And you guys changed change the name of the character from Suicide to Manic. And yeah. I, I can kind of understand why they would change the name of it. Obviously, Suicide, the word in itself has got a pretty bad connotation to it. Um, yeah. You know, was that the reason behind it is like, you know, obviously um, to change it away from that word? So I think that they were already kind of thinking that because at the time, at that time, I think that was in my opinion, that was kind of like the height of TNA impact, like as far as like the 
growth of the company because they were we were running arenas it was kind of like what aew is now like it was yeah. really popping at that time the roster was strong we had aj jeff hardy kurt angle staying all the, we had a lot of great guys and and, uh, and we were running big places and so i think they were kind of thinking that's sort of an awkward look but it was actually before the boston pay-per-view at slam anniversary ironically we're about to have slam anniversary again <laughs> um <laughs> so it's fitting fitting i could tell the story and uh i was i was up for an X Division title match, and and we were doing a big arena in, in Boston, and uh, I remember saying it because the Boston um, bombing was not like right before that had happened, and um, I remember thinking, man, like I asked, I think Devon Dudley, who was a, a producer at the time for them, and I said, Ken, should we change this name? And I said, I, I feel like maybe doing the gun to the head taunt and stuff that's really kind of dark. Mm. um not not that not that you can't make a character like that it's fantasy and i get it you know like comic books or anything but maybe now's not the best time contemporary speaking you know yeah and he agreed and then they they went back and they said well what about changing it to manic and i said yeah that's great so i mean i kind of had started the ball rolling because i told him i didn't feel comfortable calling myself suicide and like you know hey like <laughs> like mm -hmm. it, it, when everybody's just kind of down at the time you know and so they they thought it's a good idea and they they picked a new name and and it, it fit it worked so yeah no i think it, it definitely did work and you really evolved the, the the character as well and you made the the suicide manic character your own um you know when especially you know when you joined up with james storm and and the revolution and you know changed the appearance of it and that's one thing that, you know, from seeing your career, you've definitely been one of those guys that have evolved your character and your gimmick over time. Obviously, now you're completely covered in tattoos down both arms. <laughs> um, you know, and and to me, the, the revolution that you guys did in that with, with James Storm was amazing because it showed a deeper, darker side of you, even though you did have that suicide name, but it, it brought out another level, another layer of levels to your character in that. Did you feel the same way or was it, you know, something that you just felt like, yeah, this is just the situation I'm in right now? Um, no, no, I, I definitely felt the same way. I, um, you know, I had mentioned earlier, it was a relief to finally be myself in WWE, but I, I've always approached wrestling for me that like, I guess the way that Johnny Depp would approach acting. Like I love mm. characters. I love being able to do these different things. I've had like 10 different mass characters in my career, you know, in Lucha Vavum, I play a stripper fireman and uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I played Puma before, which was like an American tiger mask. And I've played suicide, which is like, you know, a video game comic book character. I've, I've, mm. I, 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 I pretty much play into a lot of Filipino stereotypes <laughs> as myself now in impact wrestling. And like, there's, I love playing characters. And so, um, you know, I, I looked at that as it was a, a creative angle to to have new inspiration to add a different layer to this character arc. And I remember really kind of basing it off of like, uh, you know, being a mercenary for James Storm and being a bad guy, almost like a recruiter and being kind of deceitful and, and, and things like that and having a lot of promo time. I kind of based it off of um, Once Upon a Time in Mexico, the Johnny Depp character, where he's kind of like this two-faced, you don't really know what side of the line he's on. And he always had these funny, quirky, interesting interactions with people one on one. And that's whenever they give me these one on one promos, that's a lot of what I channeled was like kind of like Deadpoolish, like humor and and uh, Johnny Depp's character from Once Upon a Time in Mexico, just because I, I thought, you know, everybody is so testosterone fueled wrestling promo yeah. guy. And I was like, how, how can I be more laid back and be entertaining in a totally different like wavelength? And that's what I would try to do yeah no and you can definitely see that and yeah no i i dug it man i i really did dig it i think you know you know it, <laughs> with you. a lot of with a lot of cool things in wrestling man i always feel like they could uh keep it going a little bit longer but uh, another like uh, like i said we will get we're just going to start winding up but uh i did have one question that was asked that uh, a viewer wanted to ask earlier um which was what was the idea behind the Super Mario gimmick um, that you were wanting to do in WWE? So you, you wanted to do a, a character which is Super Mario inspired. Can um, you talk about that? Yeah. So how that came about when I got through the CWC, you know, it, it was great because I got to kind of like demonstrate exactly who I was, you know, a 
a young kid from like lower middle class Los Angeles and Southern California. Most people that have an LA character in, in wrestling, it's like, oh, Hollywood, sunglasses, rich, you know, fancy cars and, you know, shit yeah. like that. And the real Southern California kids wear Vans shoes and they're skaters and they have trucker hats and like they're down, like there's a totally different wavelength that's very normal like to them. And that's what I wanted to be. And I'm an Asian American, so I got to do all this. And uh, after it was done, CFO Money was called me at home. They said, okay, pay-per-view's coming up. You're going to Raw. We're, we're working on your music. Did you like the music you had in CBC? And I said, you know, it's no. I mean, I, it's a nice song, but it's not very fitting for me. I'm not like very alt-rock, Florida rock type of guy. Sure, they said, man. what do you like? Yeah, so they said, what do you like? And uh, I gave them this list that was horrible. I gave them a terrible <laughs> list. I was like, they're like, what do you like? And I said, um, Elvis, Tupac, <laughs> Billy <Jesus>. Holiday, Chuck <laughs> Berry, Blink-182, Nirvana, Rolling Stones, you know, Led Zeppelin. Like, I mean, it just didn't fit at all. And then 20 minutes later, I'm like, God, that's terrible. They're not going to be able to make anything with that shit. So I called them back and I said, listen, I really want to create a character that's like Scott Pilgrim and Ready Player One. Um, yeah. And it came it came about because of Drew Gulak, actually, if, if we're being oh, wow. honest, like we, we were sitting around in the middle of the CWC and we we're watching the other matches on the on the in the theater. We were done at the time. And he said, you had a really great match tonight. And, I, and he's an old friend of mine. You know, and I was like, yeah, I mean, it, they've all been great. We're all every they picked a great group of dudes. And he said, yeah, but you have this way of moving. You, you almost look too perfect. You look like a video game character. If we were a video game, you would be the character I'd want to play all the time. I said, thank you. And I said, that's actually a big um, complaint about me, usually in big companies. Vince used to complain about it all the time. Like, were well, you just dirty it up? Like, you, you, you're too perfect. You have to kind of mess things up and it's got to be gritty. Like, you know. Like, Stop watching, bu- Stop bu- yeah. kid. <laughs> yeah, like too too much too much muhammad ali dancing and not enough like roberto duran like you know yeah he wanted he wants more realism and and uh which i get i totally understand but like i moved the way i moved you know like some people that's just the way it is it looks it looks beautiful in that way and that's how i move i'm really graceful and and so i just decided fuck it i'm gonna own it at this point and uh so I, I wanted to create a human video game character like a Scott Pilgrim or Ready Player One. So I told CFO, I said, can you make Dr. Wiley's castle? And they said, yes, I know exactly what you want. And they made it. And then when I got to Raw, I heard it. And I'm like, this is amazing. I went to the production guys. I said, can you make the stage look like this? Make it look like Marvel versus Capcom loading screen with like a power bar. And then they said, yeah, what And what about this? We'll do power ups on the ramp that like, like shoot up the ramp, like Zelda and Super Mario, like hearts and like you know coins and shit like that and i said fuck yeah let's do it That's we even dope. had yeah we prepped a, a a concept for a wrestlemania entrance if it had come up in orlando or even new orleans um where we were going to do mario kart i wanted to drive a a go-kart and they were just <laughs> since we have the we have the digital ramp yeah and like you have to kind of work around what you're given like i know i'm low on the totem pole so i can't ask for like pyro and shit that's expensive (laughs) so i said well what what can i do that fits my character that costs them zero money and i said well what if we just rent a go-kart and turn the digital ramp to a rainbow and it'll be rainbow road and i'll just drive down my the music is perfect already just put just put a digital um yeah, like a digital uh, starting like lights, like do 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 at the top, and then I'll just yeah. race down the other thing. <laughs> so that was my concept for a Mania entrance. Maybe I'll do it at Wrestle Kingdom or something. I don't know, but <laughs> dude, that's fucking dope, man. That would be insane. But uh, guys, it is time for that part of the show that we all love, that we all come to see. It's time for guess the Aussie slang. So I have briefed TJ prior to the show that this is what we're going to be do doing. So it's nothing new. He has been to Australia and he has Australian friends. So, so TJ, are you ready? Oh man, you you've built it up now that if I get one wrong, I look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> all right man i'm gonna I'm, I'm, I'm gonna start it off i'm gonna start it off for you okay so all right let, let's go let's, uh, let's go all right hey mate would you like a dart oh gosh uh would i, I mean dart. is that just asking if you want a drink no a cigarette oh man 
okay. So I was uh, thinking, where where would you play darts? And it was like, do you want to go do that? Okay, <laughs> I got you. Okay, that that's, makes sense. That's all right. Hey, TJ, up here, mate. Just Chucky Yui. Uh, turn around at the next uh, light, like a U-turn. Yep, U-turn. You got it. Okay. Oh, mate. I'm feeling pretty cactus this morning. Cactus. Uh, I mean, I get dry, thirsty, maybe. I don't know. Uh, it means dead and, and sort of like... Trick, you know, prickly? Oh, okay, dead, yeah, yeah. Dead, broken, dead. yeah. Usually when you're hungover, you're going, oh, mate, I feel a bit, bit cactus. Okay, so this one is going to be, be worth two points, all right? Because that's a couple of ones okay. in there. All right. Oh, mate. Me old uh, Gary Jack's a bit Billy Moore. Oh, my God. What? <laughs> what is that? Well, the old Gary Jack, meaning my back, and a bit Billy Moore means sore. So those two guys are famous rugby ah, league players from the 80s okay. and 90s. So, yeah. All right. So, hey, can you pass me me flano? Say that again. Can you pass me my flano? Um, jacket or hoodie? It's Covering? a flannelette, flannelette shirt. Okay. Flannel. Like, it, it, would you, yeah, would you say that like if you're like cold or something? Or going out? I don't know. Yeah, like, I don't know. You're going out or you just want to put a okay. shirt on. Or like, hey, pass All me right. me flannel. So, okay. okay. Right. So, we, we got another one. Oh, man. Do you like Akadaka? Oh, God. I don't know. Akadaka. Akadaka. I, I can't get this one. ACDC, we call them Akadaka. Oh, I, I never would have got that. And I love ACDC. Damn it. All right. Hey, mate, you want to come over to my house and get on the piss? Get on come the over piss. And drink? Yeah, that's it, man. All that's right, it. Yeah. Hey, there you go. All right. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what. That bloke over there is a friggin' mongrel. Um,. I like. I don't know this this idiot is wild or something. Yeah, something someone like someone who's just a dick, like just a mongrel, a you know, dickhead, yeah. whatever you want to call yeah, him. Yeah. Okay. Here, skull this. <laughs> Here, skull this. Skull it. Oh, skull it. Um, yeah, skull. Like like pound it. Yep. Chug it. Chug it down. Yeah. Chug it. Yeah. All right. All right, so this one is a this one's going to be a three part, all right? <laughs> so, oh, all right, we got to swing past the servo, then we got to go to the bottle o and pick up a slab. So, servo, bottle o, and slab. Okay, uh, servo. I'm guessing I don't know, maybe store, gas station, something like that. Yeah, petrol. Okay. Gas, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what was the second one? Bottle o. Uh, the bar, the liquor store, liquor like store. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's two. Okay, to and, I, and I guess to pick, up, to, to pick up a crate, to pick up a pallet. Uh, pick up a, a slab of beer, like a cart. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. We call it we call it a, like a pallet out here. Okay, okay. There you go. Well, right. we, we'll we'll do a couple more for you. So uh, <laughs> you're getting warmed up now. You're rubbing the hands together. And <laughs> I'm trying to get sharp, man. Oh, I like how 50% of them are basically drinking based. Dude, we're Australians, man. We love to fucking drink, bro. Like, seriously. <laughs> All right. Um, up at a sparrow's fart. Oh, uh, up, up early in the morning. That's correct. That's All correct. Right. All right. So next one. Oh, mate, I'll tell you what, that was a bit of hard yakker. Hard yakker. Um, I'm guessing hard work. Yep, hard work. Long day, something like that. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Dad's outside and he's wearing his budgie smuggler again. <laughs> budgie smuggler. I don't know what that would mean. <laughs> so that's a speedo because, like, you know, when a guy wears a speedo oh, and he gets oh, wet and he gets out of the water, it looks like he's. <laughs> <laughs> Smuggling a budgie, I guess. <laughs> all right, I got I got a couple more uh, for you. All right. All right. You want a sausage sanger? Sausage sanger. Sausage sandwich? 
Yeah, that's it. It is uh, like it is the it's a, an Australian delicacy, and all it is is a sausage on one slice of bread, bit of tomato sauce, maybe some barbecued onion. Mate, go down to know, your local Bunnings and try one. I'm pretty sure I had that last time I was in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things you got to have that a meat pie uh a beer i had a meat pie as well I had a yeah meat pie. dude that, that's an australian delicacy man right there <laughs> all right so <sighs> are you fair dinkum or what god damn it i know i've heard this one i've literally heard this one in action now i, I but i don't know what it is <laughs> Fair dinkum. It means uh, to be really true or genuine. Like, are you, are you being serious right now? Like, fair dinkum. Well, so what's the etymology, or I, I don't know what, what's how does that come about? Fair dinkum. Like, yeah, you say to me, um, I don't know. You can say something that's like completely like outrageous, and you go, "You, f- mate, you fair dinkum? Like, are you for real? Right, right are you, now? Are you yeah. being for real? Yeah, yeah. You being for real? Are you, are you working me or it, like? What I mean is, what is what does fair dinkum mean? Like, I know what it means in the colloquial, but where, how, how, what, why that choice of wording? <laughs> I don't know, man. It, it's it's something that's been around longer than I. Have. <laughs> so I, kind of, I kind of just, I, it's one of those things that we just sort of go with. But all right, so I'll go one more. All right, so you want a bicky? A bicky, a bicky. I don't know. Would that that be like offering a bite of something? No, a bicky is like a, a biscuit, or or you in America, you guys call them oh, a cookie. Okay. So like a chocolate oh, chip okay. cookie would go. Would you like a bicky? So, but that's been the Australian slang game. TJ, All you right. killed it, bro. But uh, guys, I, at, least, at least I got a few. He did, man. You did. <laughs> TJ, hang hang back till we go off air. Guys, thank you very much. You, uh, This has been Shooting the Shit Uncensored. I am Piers Austin. TJ, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been Thanks an absolute me. pleasure. And, man, we have to do this again sometime, 100%, bro, if you're down. Absolutely. So- Guys, thanks for watching, and uh, thanks to our sponsors, Mayan Belts, A-Rock Designs, Signal Studios, and uh, we'll catch you again soon, guys. Thanks very much. Bye now.